April 30th, 1981, songwriter and Grateful Dead lyricist Robert Hunter played Ripley's in Philadelphia. He was also interviewed for some kind of local cable access show or something similar. Don't see it up on YouTube. I got it from Netta Gilboa, who many deadheads will remember as the editor of Gray Areas fanzine or magazine. And she was a very early internet tape trading music moving via the internet person. I mean, before kind of there was the web, she was doing that stuff. And her, her magazine, Gray Areas, was a combination of like a computer hack and music culture magazine. Didn't last long, but it was cool. And uh, she, she laid me on a whole bunch of cool beta tapes with all kinds of dead stuff that doesn't appear to circulate. So, this is Hunter talking, talking about the dead scene and how it never ever changes and how his 1981 solo album was going to be called Touch of Grey. Uh oh. Uh oh. Something changed. Uh, we're taking that song, Robert. He also talks about what will happen to the Grateful Dead after people pass away. He's a little less delicate in how he describes it. He was wrong. He should have been right. We wouldn't hear such slow versions of these songs if he'd been right. He'll be right soon. Get right with GD. I always chain smoke during interviews, but I do so few television interviews. I'll have to break the habit. We have speed. We're going? We're rolling? Okay. Ready? Three, two, one. Tell me about your association with Jerry Garcia when you first met him, how you got together. Well, it was uh, Christmas of 1964 and a large box appeared at my apartment door marked postage due and uh, cost me I think uh, seven dollars and twelve cents and I opened it up and there was Jerry Garcia it would have been 715 if he didn't have the missing finger but there was a little bit off on the weight for that <laughs> now uh, you were in a, were you in a jug van with him uh, well we had a we started out we both got out of the army about the same time and we're bumming around the streets of Palo Alto, kind of looking for, uh, well, you know, when a young man gets out of the Army, you know, with your severance pay of $125, you're out uh, looking uh, to make some more. And uh, um, I just ran into him at St. Michael's Alley, a coffee house, and uh, we went to a party, and uh, I picked up the guitar, as I usually do, to begin uh, entertaining the party as a folk singer. And uh, Jerry listened through one song, and he said, give me that guitar, and he grabbed it away, and he's had the guitar ever since. <laughs> but we, then we did a, a folk duet for uh, about a year, and then uh, went into playing bluegrass music, and then from that into old-timey music, and then into jug band music from that. And then about the time they became a rock and roll band, it was uh, time for me to think about being the serious writer that I thought I was. And, 21 or 22 and uh, so I went over to writing novels well well they uh, they start doing this rock and roll thing as the warlocks and then uh, when they became the Grateful Dead which is shortly after uh, Jerry asked me if uh, if I would write for them and I thought it was a pretty strange proposition because I considered myself a serious writer but then I didn't at that time it, it didn't seem impossible that serious writing could be combined with the rock form so I gave it a try and I'm still doing it what was the first song that you wrote together well when we were about 18 and 19 I wrote something he's a year younger than I wrote uh, some called uh, my old man's cat but that's never been heard by the public I think uh, probably China cat sunflower alligator and uh, uh, dark star now throughout the years uh, you're you live in England why is that well, for personal reasons I have uh, a very complex 
uh, set up with my family, which is my personal business, basically. It's, uh, um, I would prefer to live in the United States, and I'm trying to aim it to where I can get back to California comfortably, but there's lots of kids involved and things like this, and uh, uh, it's difficult to uproot everybody. So I generally zip over here and then uh, stay for a while and zip back or come over for the purposes of doing a tour to support that shooting match. When you write today, and correct me if I'm wrong, you write lyrics and send them to the band and they add the music? You don't write in the same time, the same place, or, or not? Oh, no. I have... Uh... Tell me about the craft of, of writing mm. songs with this band. How, how does that come about? Well, I haven't been writing a lot of songs with the band for the last couple of years. And uh, I've just finished or, or, uh, trying to do a record with uh, Garcia playing a uh, lead acoustic guitar on it and me playing acoustic. We had John Kahn and Mickey and Billy. And uh, we came near to completing it. Uh, but then I went off to England because the Grateful Dead had commandeered the studio in order to finish their album. And uh, in the meantime, I've written some more songs, and so I've, I've told Jerry to take, take those and uh, rewrite the music as fits him, And because uh, uh, he likes all the songs. They're strong songs. He thinks they sound a bit similar like that. If he puts his hand to them, they'll, they'll all sound a lot different. Is that the case of Alabama Getaway? Alabama Getaway was, uh, I wrote as a Delta Blues style song and was performing it for a while. And uh, I didn't feel that my performance was very effective, but I knew I had a good set of lyrics, and so I gave them to Jerry, and uh, he did them up proper. Sounds good. I do a version of it now, which is a combination of what I used to do with it and what he's done with it. I use his chords, but I, I use slide guitar on it and make a delta sound with it. So now, on your records, how many uh, songs are written you know, for your show, and how many do you or do you consciously not, not aware of how many songs are going to become Grateful Dead songs, how many songs are going to remain Robert Hunter songs? Well, to begin with, I was writing only Grateful Dead songs for about 10 or 12 years, and I found I couldn't write songs for myself very well, but I had, I had a lot of them left over, which I made some albums with. Uh, but I wasn't sure that I could just sit down and write for myself. There was, there was something about the Grateful Dead energy that, that just really got me off the dime. And when I thought, I'm writing Grateful Dead, I was writing a mile a minute. When I think, why don't I write something for myself, I draw a blank. But uh, as I've um, moved away from the band, which I, in fact, have, you know, physically, um, and have eyes to, uh, to, to make some records, as Lester Young would say, um, I'm beginning to find I can write for myself and uh, without thinking, all right, this song is going to come out of Jerry Garcia's mouth or Bob Weir's mouth. This is going to come out of my mouth now. Uh, I find that I write a little bit differently, although I'm not sure that the fans would, would notice it because I probably, whatever I write for anybody under any circumstances would sound like me. But the things that I'm writing for myself right now, uh, to my mind, are considerably different and a lot more personal. Why do the Grateful Dead, you, everybody associated with them, have this uh, legion of fans who are called deadheads that are loyal and follow you around? What is it that... I think they liked the name. They fancied the name to begin with. Got to see something called the Grateful Dead. And the Jefferson Airplane was another name like that. And I think that was the... Uh, then there was the uh, connection with the acid tests and uh, the whole uprising of psychedelia. Uh, our name and the airplane's name were mentioned most prominently, and probably because the name was the Grateful Dead. But the people don't follow the Jefferson Airplane around the way they do you and, and members of the Grateful Dead. No, well, they got a liking for it, finally. Although that audience is changing very, very much now. Um, I see uh, clean-cut kids out there like is not these days, which is a, quite a shock. This wasn't true a year ago. <laughs> what kind of letters do you get from, uh, from deadheads that write to you about your lyrics? I get letters that say, uh, I know you were writing this song about me, and you're messing with my brain. You're warping me. Why won't you answer? I'm uh, being driven to desperation. Tell me 
what to do next. Or, well, thank you very much. Your work has been very inspirational to me and helped me through some hard times, and I would just like to write and thank you, which is my favorite letter to get. <laughs> what's, in the, what's in the future for you? Are you going to be writing some... Excuse me, some lyrics for the next Grateful Dead album, and the next one's going to be the second set of the uh, live stuff, but will you be doing writing for the next studio album by the Grateful Dead? I assume I will. I don't, I don't see. Well, as I was telling you, uh, if uh, Jerry wants to pick up on uh, some of these tunes that we were recording for my Touch of Grey album, was the title of it, uh, then he's welcome to it, because uh, some of them are very, very strong songs, and I think they'd be a lot stronger for the dead than they would for me. Some of them are definitely banned songs. Are these songs you've been doing for a while? Mm hmm Do you want to mention a few, the ones that you do in your show? Well, I got one called Keep Your Day Job, and, uh, oh, Sweet Little Wheels, and... I just drew a blank. There's at least eight or nine of them. I can't remember. I, I'm starting to edit and decide which ones they can keep and which ones I want to write now. <laughs> But tonight I'm going to I'm going to be doing a lot of the of the tunes that uh, I've been working on this time in England. It's been a happier time for me uh, than before. Uh, my life has been settling down a bit, and uh, the last batch of songs that I wrote on the tour out here and the ones which were on that album tend to be pretty negative. My life was uh, being thrown all which ways at this time. I went through a lot of trouble, and uh, the songs now. Uh, uh, have that behind them. I, I don't want to say that they're positive still, but I, I do find over the years when I listen back to any of those songs that I've said uh, much more about myself than I ever expected that I was saying, and that the songs are a lot more transparent than I thought at the time. And, uh, and I'm beginning to see them this way. I've been putting my diary out in public forum now for 15 years. What of the, of the old songs are still in your set that, that the dead do? Oh, I do a lot of them. I do, uh, do Brown Eyed Women, often do Friend of the Devil, that little version of Truckin' that I pull off, do Ripple. Uh, I'd say mostly songs from the Working Man's Dead American Beauty phase, which uh, I find are the most singable for, uh, for a solo performer. They're, they're more folk in feeling than the later songs. Truckin' is, is sort of a biographical song. Were you on the road with him at the time? Mm-hmm. Yeah, we wrote it from city to city. And uh, when we were in New York, I'd write something about New York, and uh, blah, blah, blah. And then we all finished, finished it. We all gathered around a swimming pool in Florida on a hot day and set it to music. <laughs> what's, what's the music scene like in England? I mean, how are you received over there? Because the Dreadful Dead is not as big, and, and you... Were... No, they haven't been there for seven years, and when they came back, uh, uh, well, the kids who had seen them last time were not there. I think the audience looked to be about 17 or 18, mostly, and so those kids must have been about 10 or 11 last time the dead were there. So they have failed to keep their following. Plus, we're almost the antithesis of um, the, what... Uh, the English dig in music right now, as you well know. It's, uh, it's solid new wave, solid punk, and uh, anything that smacks of the 60s uh, has a limited audience right now of, of devotees, but uh, it evades the fads entirely right now, and England is so very fad conscious. Why do you think the Grateful Dead, just celebrating 15 years, have been able to achieve that kind of longevity? The average life for a band is maybe two, three years. We all committed ourselves, uh, well, to begin with, we all have been close friends and grown up together and, uh, and through our, our early 20s and whatnot. And uh, similar musical interests, a strong sense of community, and from the beginning, a strong commitment to doing this as a career. And uh, I don't think it really occurs to any of this that it's ever going to stop, although one of these days, uh, a couple of us are going to drop dead or something like that, and it's suddenly going to be over still. You know, when I went to see them in London last month, I hadn't seen them in some time. And I walked backstage, the same characters sitting on the boxes, the same setup, the same songs. It was like a, an opportunity to re-inhabit my past, which I think very few people have. 
And I thought, why, this always goes on. It's like it's always gone on and always will go on. And, uh, and then I thought, no, that's just an illusion because one day it's not going to be going on anymore. And it made me kind of sad. Throughout uh, living in England now, it's, it's tougher for you. You're usually out on tour when they are on tour, but not necessarily in the same city. In the earlier days, did you tour a lot more with them? Oh, always, yeah. I was out on the road with them all the time until, I guess, uh, 1973, when uh, I suddenly had seen all the towns, and uh, I had seen the road inside out and backwards, and uh, it just became a bloody bore to be out there. If I didn't have a guitar in my hand, I didn't see any more sense to being out there. And we had ceased doing a lot of writing on the road. It had gotten more into the, just the grunge drive thing of being out there. And, uh, you know, I find the road, well, I don't say I find it pleasant by myself because it's a gruel. I'm working seven days in a row in seven different cities here almost. And uh, um, the travel is arduous. But the uh, always getting on stage is a pleasure, and, and uh, I don't say it makes it worthwhile, but uh, it uh, it helps. <laughs> okay, so we can look forward in the future then to your another album, which you tentatively have titled "A Touch of Gray." I hope. You're call I it? hope so. Well, I'm going to have to call it that now because uh, I had Herbie Green in San Francisco uh, and do a, a cover for it, and uh, and. Uh, all the artwork and stuff and then i decided not to do it and there's herbie with this album cover so i suppose that will be the title of it although now i'm tending more towards touch of darkness but i can't be too perverse about these things i've got an album and a title the devil i'll go with it <laughs> do you have any idea when you'll be touring in, in the states again oh uh, let's see this is april and it's almost may probably september october I think that I get out here about uh, every four months. I go on the road for about three weeks. Well, I hope we can interview you uh, on the 30th anniversary. All right. Thank you very much, Ron. Quite welcome. Hey, it's rolling. Here we go. Just talk to the <clears throat> Okay. Do you want him facing me also? Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, you can see the shadow bomb, Mark. That's good. Do you want me to tell you a question? Yeah. Uh, Tell me about how you first met Jerry Garcia. Uh oh, okay. oh, that one. No, right. Oh, no, you don't have an answer. I think I'll make up another answer. That was a good one I gave you last time, wasn't it? I had you going for a minute. Tell me about the first time you met Jerry Garcia. Um, blah, 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 one sentence or a sentence and a half in, something like that. We'll cut it there and it makes the flow of a, of a cut interview work a little bit better. I think I remember. Okay. You were in a jug band together? No, a bluegrass band, an old-timey band. I wasn't uh, in the jug band. It was, uh, Jerry asked me if I'd like to play jug, and uh, I gave a couple toots on it and couldn't get a sound and handed it back. I considered it was beneath me. <laughs> Good. What was the first song you wrote for? What was the first song that you wrote for The Grateful Dead? It was probably China Cat, Sunflower, or Alligator, or something like that. But I sent them a couple of tunes from New Mexico that I had written, and then uh, when I got back, they put them together, and I was with them from that point on.
Good for me. 